We left off last time at the end of the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln is assassinated in 1865. Now, Abraham Lincoln, um, you know, according to Frederick Douglass, is somebody who's super sympathetic to the rights of African Americans. So Lincoln... Its body was taken around the country to be processed um, so everybody could mourn his death. And African Americans in New York City uh, were initially banned from participating in the memorial to Lincoln. Some did participate uh, despite this ban, but this was pretty upsetting to black New Yorkers. Uh, Frederick Douglass, he, he decided to do something about this, and so he organized his own memorial for Abraham Lincoln that would be held at Cooper Union. Remember, Cooper Union is the, the famous hall that Abraham Lincoln uh, sort of laid out his abolitionist platform in 1860 after visiting Plymouth Church in Brooklyn. Uh, Frederick Douglass said... Uh, at Lincoln's memorial, no people as a class have more reason to lament Lincoln's death and revere his memory than the colored people of the United States. Uh, unfortunately for Douglas, he would live to sort of see a lot of the progress that comes in the immediate wake of the Civil War eradicated uh, by Jim Crow. Lincoln is replaced by his vice president, a guy named Andrew Johnson. And Andrew Johnson uh, came to that position because Lincoln was trying to, you know, make a bunch of moderates feel a little better about the election in 1864. He didn't think he was going to die, obviously. Now, Andrew Johnson is a Southerner. Andrew Johnson is a racist. Andrew Johnson, he is not very keen on giving rights to black folks. Um, president Lincoln had some thoughts and some plans laid out uh, before he was assassinated, but that's all over. He appoints former Confederates a lot of times to take over uh, the states uh, that had rebelled against the Union. They appoint all white governments. All the land was returned to slave owners. Black folks were denied access to land, even though they had been promised land by folks like General Sherman, who promised them 40 acres and a mule. Andrew Johnson allows for the establishment of black codes, which are, you know, all of these new laws implemented in southern states where they replace the word slave with Negro. It's a continuation of the white supremacy that existed under slavery after the Civil War. Congress isn't going to have any part of this. They, they think uh, this is outrageous. Um, this is defeating the purpose of the Civil War. And so they sort of take over the process of Reconstruction and, and they take it away from President Andrew Johnson. They actually passed the Civil Rights Bill of 1866, which makes these black codes illegal and eventually will be come the 13th Amendment, which officially ends slavery. But Andrew Johnson isn't about all this, right? So he vetoes the bill for the first time in U.S. history. You have an overriding of a veto. This is a big deal. Um, and so you have this period starting in 1867, and it'll last a little less than a decade, uh, of Congressional Reconstruction, where troops are sent to the South, and you have the passage of the Reconstruction Amendments to make sure that, you know, white supremacy isn't reestablished. You have the passage of these Reconstruction Amendments. Uh, 13th Amendment ends slavery, but is conditioned on the idea that if you are arrested uh, and, and convicted of a crime, you can become a slave, uh, you see a massive increase in the conviction of African Americans in the U.S. South. 14th Amendment makes black folks citizens, right? This uh, ensures that all African Americans are citizens and also has pretty big ramifications for immigrants because their children um, are citizens. Uh, 15th Amendment gives them voting rights, but again, only black men, and these are pretty limited uh, because there are other ways to deny the vote. But what these amendments don't do is they don't give any property or, or economic justice to African Americans who really, as we've talked about in the last episode, not only built the South, but helped build northern cities like New York. My folks in the South, they have gone from owning these people as property to being told that these people can run for government. And a lot of places in the South, you have majority black populations. And so that means they're going to win some elections. And um, 
during this period, over 2,000 African Americans will win election. Uh, you have 14 House members and two senators who are black being elected from the South. Oscar J. Dunn of Louisiana served as lieutenant governor of the state for six years following the Civil War. Pickney Pinchbeck um, was an African-American from Georgia who served as the state's governor between 1872 and 1873. This upended the existing power structure in the U.S. South. White Southerners were like, we're not going to be taking this, and they resorted to terrorism. Uh, Just a warning, this section contains graphic images which convey the terrorism African Americans were facing when hundreds of thousands fled north for safety and greater equity. If you wish to avoid seeing these images, please skip to the next section, the Great Migration. In the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, white Southerners were intent on reestablishing the structures of white supremacy. This process took off following the end of Reconstruction, when white Northerners wanted to stop funding the federal occupation of the South. And so white Southerners began to found organizations like the Ku Klux Klan, which was founded in 1866, and they start a campaign of terrorism. And when we talk about refugees coming from places like Syria today, this is what was happening in the U.S. South in in the 1860s. In Memphis in 1866, um, there were three days of rampaging throughout the black community by white folks, a lot of police officers, that left 46 blacks dead. All of the black churches and schools were burnt to the ground. Women were raped. Um, Houses were burned. Um, People were beat up and maimed. And it's this event that that sort of forces um, Northerners to step in and, and begin to take control of Reconstruction. But uh, when they would leave in the 1870s, uh, you, you see sort of a return to this violence. Uh, one of the largest massacres took place in 1873 in Colfax, Louisiana, where hundreds of blacks were killed, killed for their attempts to declare their own freedom on their own terms and make claims for their own liberation. And these white folks called themselves redeemers, and what they were redeeming was white supremacy in the South. And so this is the system that we're left with. Black folks do not have economic rights because the federal government reneged on the promise of 40 acres and a mule the famous court ruling Plessy versus Ferguson in the 1890s. Separate versus equal becomes the law of the land in the South, and African Americans are put in lesser institutions, and so they don't have access to educational rights. And then even in instances where black folks have claimed political power, um, in a place like Wilmington, North Carolina, where the majority of the population was black, Um, They instituted a fusion government, which was white folks and black folks working to to run the city together. Uh, They were overthrown in a coup, um, the only coup in U.S. history, where terrorists, white terrorists, came through and murdered a bunch of African Americans, uh, forced a bunch more to flee, and uh, they took over the government. So you have this mass violence, this reign of terror that's going on in the U.S. South, and so what do you do? I mean, you're living through this. What, you can ask the same question for people who are living through the violence and, and the economic injustice and the political injustice in places like Central America and Syria today. What do you do? You're, you're forced to choose between uh, the safety of your family and uh, what you consider home. Um, and, and a lot of people said, you know, we can't keep living here. The flood of African Americans from the South begins with the end of Reconstruction and the resumption of white supremacy through terrorism. 90% of the African American community lived in the South uh, to just over 50% of the African American community living in the U.S. South. So this massive migration of people. African Americans decided to make the trek north in what would become known as the Great Migration. White folks who ran the South at this point didn't want this to happen. They wanted to keep the cheap labor in the South. They just wanted them to be continuously subordinated. But a lot of black folks said, I cannot continue to live under these terroristic conditions. And they made the journey north. Then you have the outbreak of World War I. The United States needs soldiers to go fight in World War I. You need a labor force to work in the factories. Where are most of the factories? They're in the north. During this period, you have a lot of radical organizing uh, by white immigrant groups, particularly the Jews and the Italians. 
in response, uh, a lot of owners want to divide the workforce. And one way to do this is to bring in another group um, to have these groups sort of compete against each other. You have white owners of factories encouraging immigration of African Americans to the North in the early 20th century, with uh, New York City being one of the major destinations in Harlem in New York City eventually emerging as uh, sort of the capital uh, of black intellectual and cultural thought. Um, so the name Harlem actually came from the Dutch. Uh, the English took over, as we talked about, in 1664, uh, and they tried to change the name to Lancaster. Um, the Dutch weren't having that. The other folks who were living there weren't having that. The name remained Harlem. Uh, slaves connected Dutch Harlem to New York City, which was all the way at the southern tip of the island, um, uh, building a road that would eventually become known as Broadway. By the early 1800s, it was becoming a less rural region of the island, although there were still large estates and farmland, um, but this was slowly disappearing uh, to turn into sort of the wealthy suburbs of New York City. Um, especially after the building of Central Park, this becomes sort of like a new hot spot where everybody wants to move. This was especially true after the 1880s uh, when Harlem was connected to downtown via the Overground Railroad. Um, so this is a prosperous suburb. Uh, wealthy people will work downtown and then commute up by train or by boat to Harlem until there's a major depression that hits the country in 1893. Just about the time that Harlem's getting up and running, you got all these uh, businesses and, and real estate developers who are investing in it, and then you have an economic crash. Um, so Harlem kind of changes gears, and it starts to advertise itself more to an immigrant population. And so we're talking about Jewish immigrants, German immigrants, Italian immigrants, Irish immigrants. Uh, they move into this neighborhood. And uh, the center of that Harlem that uh, they occupy is 125th Street. But something is going to begin to start taking place starting in about 1904. The African-American population in New York City has continuously been pushed up the island, right? We could go all the way back to where they were living just north of the wall in Wall Street as a free community, sort of serving as a buffer between native populations and the Dutch settlers. Uh, there was a community in Greenwich Village that got kind of pushed up. There was a community in uh, the Five Points area uh, that got burnt down and destroyed, you had a community in what is now Central Park that gets burned to the ground in the 1850s to make way for Central Park. Um, you did have communities developing around this time in what was then called San Juan Hill and is now the home of Lincoln Center and Hell's Kitchen. Um, however, at the beginning of the 1900s, the center of black life on the island of Manhattan shifts to Harlem. And the reason for that is these African Americans have an opportunity to get out of the slums of Hell's Kitchen and San Juan Hill and, and move into this area that was designed for wealthy people. Um, it ended up not working out because you had an economic recession, but, you know, these houses were very nice. You had indoor plumbing in a lot of them. But it's not like apartment owners just one day said, oh, you know what, we should invite black tenants in. Uh, this was a process, uh, and this process begins largely with one man, and his name was Philip Payton. He saw sort of this untapped uh, clientele uh, that could be renting out apartments in the African-American community, but they were denied that opportunity by white landlords throughout the city. So Peyton came up with this plan, right? He said, uh, and this is a quote, the very prejudice that has heretofore worked against us can be turned and used to our profit. He knew that white people were super racist and Part of the way this manifested is if you had black folks living in a community, property values went down. So Philip Payton and a group of black entrepreneurs, they said, we can use this to our advantage. They would buy apartment buildings. Uh, they would open them up to African-American residents. Um, this would lower property values in the surrounding buildings because you had these racist 
landlords who had assumptions about black folks and what it meant to have black people in the community. And, and then they would be able to buy other buildings much cheaper because um, of these prejudices. Hayden actually got his break because uh, there was a feud between these two uh, landlords. They owned two buildings that were right next to each other on 134th Street, and uh, one of the landlords had finally had with the other landlord, and he said, all right, you know, I'm going to punish this guy. The way I'm going to punish him is I'm going to fill my building with black folks. And Peyton saw an opportunity here, right? He uh, sets it up so African Americans can move in. It does punish the other landlord because racist white folks uh, didn't want to move into a neighborhood where African Americans were living. The resulting lack of demand by white tenants uh, it would have the effect of lowering property values throughout the community of Harlem. Another story that uh, kind of shows this dynamic, um, in 1905, the Hudson Realty Company, uh, it bought a building uh, that was owned by Peyton's Afro-American Realty Company. They kicked out all the African Americans. Uh, they thought this would be a way to increase their property value. And then they bought three additional buildings and they kicked out all the African-American residents. This speculation, however, would backfire when the Afro-American Realty Company uh, bought two adjacent apartment buildings. Uh, they ended up kicking out all the white residents, uh, filling it with the black tenants who had just been kicked out of those other buildings and uh, decreasing the property value. So you had the Hudson Realty Company ending up having to sell back to the Afro American Realty Company because the property values that they had expected by creating an all-white neighborhood didn't manifest. By the 1920s, again, this Afro-American Realty Company starts in 1904, Harlem is predominantly black with about 200,000 African Americans living in the neighborhood. And you had buildings named after African American heroes was a huge deal, right? This was um, a black neighborhood, not just in terms of the population, but in terms of the symbols of the neighborhood, in terms of the names of the neighborhood. And that mattered. And that uh, made it an extraordinarily attractive place for a lot of these African Americans who were fleeing terrorism in the South, as we discussed. When the United States entered World War I, blacks weren't allowed to join the U.S. military as regular soldiers. They could join and work as laborers or people who supplied ships, but they, they weren't given access to combat roles. Uh, that was seen as something African Americans couldn't do. Um, however, the French needed a lot of troops, and so they said, hey, you know, United States, now that you're in the war and you're our ally, the United States didn't join the war until 1917, and the conflict started in 1914. Do you mind giving us some of your troops? And the United States was like, well, no troops of the United States are allowed to be under the command of other generals. They actually, except the black troops, we don't mind parting with them. And so what you had is a situation where you had these African-American troops serving under um, French leadership, um, and they had an opportunity to fight, and some of them fought extraordinarily valiantly, including Henry Johnson, who uh, would eventually be in a group with these Harlem Hellfighters, although he, he started with a larger New York regiment. He ended up fighting off maybe 30 German soldiers by himself, killing four of them. Um, this was a huge story. This was a huge deal. He gets a huge honor by the French. They give him a very serious medal. Uh, that medal went unrecognized by the United States government for 75 years, and Johnson would die penniless in 1929, uh, just less than 15 years after the war ended. The United States actually specifically asked the French not to treat the African Americans with too much respect because they were going to come back to a society where they weren't given that respect. Uh, the U.S. government warned of black sexual tendencies in a way to make black men seem dangerous. French military authorities uh, thought it was completely untenable to treat blacks from the United States as second-class military personnel uh, in the French forces and rejected these overtures by the U.S. government. What American authorities were really anxious about, um, and a lot of the military leadership uh, was white, racist, um, from the U.S. South, but also from the U.S. North. Um, they were worried that African Americans having experienced equality during the war with their French comrades would, would return and expect the same thing at home. They were right to some degree uh, to be anxious about blacks coming back and challenging the norms that existed in the United States. They had just fought 
for the United States. Many of them had been wounded or had uh, brothers in arms lose their lives. Um, they said, you know, we've earned our equality. Despite the Harlem Hellfighters fighting under the French forces being one of the most decorated uh, U.S. units in, in the whole war, um, despite the fact that over 380,000 black Americans fought in World War I, um, despite the fact that they won prestigious medals uh, fighting for French forces, the United States that they returned to, uh, having just helped win World War I for, refused to recognize them as equals. Uh, you see a massive increase in lynchings in the 1910s because white people are insistent on maintaining the structures of white supremacy. Between April and November 1919, there were more than two dozen race riots uh, where white folks would kill or beat up or um, burn the businesses of black residents in their cities. While this violence took place in both the North and the South, an increasing number of African Americans in the late 19-teens and 1920s left their homes searching for better economic and social opportunities in Harlem. On July 28, 1917, in the sweltering heat along Fifth Avenue, 10,000 African Americans, organized by the NAACP, marched in silence to protest the race riots in East St. Louis, Illinois, which left at least 40 black people dead, killed by white mobs. This was the first racial protest of its kind in New York City. It would not be the last. 